my slides to white. So hopefully they're a little more visible, uh, but I might miss some stuff. Um, so if there is something you can't read, like there's some blue right there, doesn't matter. Hopefully everything you need to read, you can read. Uh, so anyways, this is, this is a talk about performance and user experience. Um, my name is Davey Shaffick. I am a developer and an author. Uh, I'm an open source contributor, and I am the release manager for PG71, which is kind of cool. Um, it's also a three-year commitment, which I did not realize when I signed up. <laughs> I have a release that's got to go out today, so I'm going to have to work on that. Um, I'm at Shaffick on Twitter, so uh, I like to put it first, because if you have questions, please reach out, and I have my phone here, and maybe I'll see it. Um, I work for Akamai, which uh, you've probably heard of as the world's largest CDN. Uh, we also do some really cool security and other products as well. Uh, great API, so check us out at developer.akamai.com. Um, and this may be a little gratuitous, but in every single talk I give, I always mention Prompt, which I co organized with EJ. Um, so uh, Justine did not give the URL, which is mhpump.org. Uh, this is really important, so please do check that out. All right, so let's get started. Whoa! All right, so I'll try to do the last slide and see if I can get them to come back. Um, so first of all, why performance matters. Um, so essentially, there have been a number of studies about this. One of the uh, most important ones probably is Amazon. Um, so Amazon loses a 1% of their annual revenue per 100 milliseconds in their site which is slower. So what that means is, is for uh, 2015, they would have lost a billion dollars. And to put that into some perspective, that's 15 cents for every single person on the planet, or $3.32 per US citizen. And that's per 100 milliseconds. Um, Google, some of you have probably heard of, uh, they found that if they were half a second slower, uh, there's, they've got 20% less searches. Bing, um, when they were two seconds slower, they got 4.3% less revenue per user. GQ, a uh, popular magazine, uh, they found that when they cut load time by 80%, uh, traffic went up by 80%, and time spent on the site went up by 32%. Uh, some other case studies, uh, really quickly, uh, Walmart got uh, one second improvement, led to 2% uh, increase in conversions. Um, Etsy, they found that by adding 160 kilobytes of additional imagery, uh, they had a 12% increase in bounce rate, so that's people coming in and immediately leaving. Uh, and Staples, 1% uh, improvement led to a 10% increase in conversions. So what we can conclude from this is that users could receive tiny changes in performance. And that's actually as little as 14 milliseconds, which is infinitesimally small. And slower sites make customers are less happy. Less happy is a poor user experience. Pretty easy equation. Now, this slide will not make much sense, but if my slides had been coming up, you would have noticed that every single slide was 100 milliseconds slower to render than the one before. And it's a really interesting thing when you kind of twig on to that, like sort of 400, 500 milliseconds in, you're like, wait a second, something's not right. Um, so there's an old sort of maxim, which is 10 seconds, that's what you have. 10 seconds to render everything, and if you don't get it, your users are going to go away. That's no longer true. It's very far from true. It's actually more like four seconds these days. And just yesterday, so my slides are totally up to date, Google released a study that showed that uh, you have about three seconds before 53% of your users on mobile will just go. Three seconds. And the magic number is actually around two. So who is responsible for performance? Um, the answer is everybody. Everybody is responsible for performance. It does not matter if you are a designer, sysadmins, DevOps, uh, backend developers, front-end developers, browser vendors. Everybody has a role to play when it comes to web performance. So I'm hoping this is where like, slides are really necessary. So um, modern web pages are getting bulkier and bulkier. And what we're finding these days is I have a beautiful bar down here. Like, it's just gorgeous. 63%, um, okay, it's not that great. Thanks. 63% uh, 
It's also a pie chart, not a pie chart. Okay. But 63% of web pages today, by the way, are images. 17% um, is JavaScript. You have 3% is HTML and CSS, also 3%. Fonts are 5%, and then other, whatever that is, is 9%. Um, but 63% is images, so you know anything you can do to make your images perform better is great. We'll look at that. Um, page weight also is going up quite dramatically. So while 60-ish um, percent of sites are under two megs, which is still quite large, we have like eight percent, three to four megabytes in size. There was um, did anyone see there was an article? It might be in the New York Times or something. It was a one-word article with a headline, and it was something like. Um, when, uh, when you receive a CC to the entire company, should you respond and ask to be removed out the CC? And the article, the whole article was no. And it was a six megabyte page, right? Um, additionally, the number of requests per page is going up hugely. Actually, one more thing on that. The average page size now is larger than Doom, the original Doom. So it's over one and a half inches, it will not go out of um, so the number of requests per page is also going up. So this is requests for sub-resources, images, JavaScript, CSS, etc. Um, to where you have 18% of sites now loading over 50 resources. And even on the, the very highest end of more than 150, you have 15%. It's huge. So let's talk about how we can fix some of this. So as I said, everybody has a role to play. So are there any designers here? I don't at least one because who's speaking. When we're over there. Um, number one thing, compress your images. That sounds silly, but if you don't, we're going to do it for you. And we don't know necessarily what you were going for in terms of quality. So be careful with that. Compress your images or we will do it. Um, Sys admins, DevOps folks, anybody? Have a few? Okay, so number one thing for you, please <laughs> enable HTTP2. Um, it's potentially an incredible performance when it's completely transparent. Um, just go turn it on, and you know, uh, Amazon now supports it, Akamai obviously supports it. Um, just go for it. Um, but along with that now, all browsers require SSL or TLS, actually. Um, so check out letsencrypt.org. Um, this is one of the slides that did not convert correctly. But letsencrypt.org um, is a fantastic uh, uh, certificate authority, it's completely free, it's transparent, it's open, and it's automated. So you can get these fantastic 90 day certificates that work in every single uh, operating system, going back to XP, the older IDs, every single browser. Uh, they're completely free. Uh, and as I said, they're automatable. You can try rotate them every 90 days. Something else that you can do um, is you can use the cloud to scale based on perceived performance. So typically, when we scale, we're looking at metrics like load memory usage, CPU usage, network utilization. Um, one metric that we don't use, and that I think we can use to uh, further inform our scaling decisions, is perceived performance. So um, there's something called a speed index score, uh, which is from a uh, web page test uh, site. And we uh, there's a, a node module called Marcel Durant slash web page test API. And you can use this to go ahead and grab the perceived performance, the speed index of your site at the current time. So uh, everyone can read that, that's right. Uh, try and walk through this. Um, so basically it's really simple, just simple JavaScript node stuff. So uh, you pull in the, um, the module, web page test, create the way. Um, you're then going to go ahead and instantiate that, and you're going to ask to run the test. And so here I'm running it against dataschapter.com, my site. Uh, I tell them I want the page speed, and then you have this callback. And what that callback will receive is the URL at which the results will end up at when they're done. So this is not a quick test. Um, you could spin up your own web page test instance, and then you, you're not sharing resources, so that's an option for this. Um, but essentially, you get this uh, URL back. Uh, and then I have this check response call that's going to go ahead and pull that URL until I get an actual response. Um, let's see if I can get something else to show up. So basically, I have a check response call back. Uh, it does um, a get request on that URL that I was told where my results are going to be. Uh, it will continue to retrieve the data um, until it has it all. So the way that JavaScript works is uh, there's a, a, a data event. So as data is streaming back, you will get that. You just assign it somewhere, and when it's complete, you can then run more. So I have this on end. So this is the end event. So when we got the entire response, and uh, we very simply here just say parse the JSON. All JSON APIs. Did we get 200? Yes, then we finally finished our um, 
uh, the, the whole response is now there. They've actually finished the test. And we can actually go ahead and get um, both the first view, which is an uncached view of your website, speed index, and also a repeat view. So it actually has the ability to catch the resources that are cacheable and give you a speed index with that in mind. Um, so you can take that information and make decisions to scale on. Um, so what you're seeing here is just basically the test started, and then every five seconds it will keep polling until it gets a response. And in this case, I have the, the two speed index shown. All right, so backend developers, who's, who would consider themselves a backend developer? Okay, and I know all of you full stack people, like you can just do all of this, right? Um, so this might seem obvious, but cache aggressively. Um, there's many levels of which you can cache. So database caching, uh, using something like Memcache or Cassandra. Um, full page caching, using something like Memcache or Cassandra again, but also Varnish and Squid. Um, there's also something really cool called Edge Site Include, which I had not run into before. And if you don't know it, um, they're also known as ESIs. They were created by Ackline um, and some other companies I don't care about. And they are partially supported in Varnish, Squid, and other open source um, products. So I'm not trying to sell you things. I want to make it clear. This is available through open source stuff. Um, and what these are are special HTML tags that you can put in your output that you can then have uh, different caching uh, requirements around. So you can say this fragment has a different TTL. This fragment does not get cached at all. Um, you can do it per user session. So if you have dynamic stuff, you can cache small fragments just for that user. Uh, you can also do things like geographic area and stuff like that, which is really cool. Um, so the way that these work is you have uh, two tags. You have the ESI include tag, uh, which is at the top here. So they're XML tags really, I guess. Um, ESI include, source, and then whatever you want it to actually include. So this is what your um, uh, varnish or squid is actually going to pull into a software request for. This is the cache resource with whatever um, settings that we have on it. Uh, and then you also have the option to uh, have an ESI remove. And what this is, is a more static version that is less memory intensive, but potentially generic. Uh, and it, that will be removed if the include is successful. Um, so here what I have is I'm including a greeting, um, and it's going to be personalized, so you know, David, uh, otherwise we'll just get a generic hello. So, nice fallback there. Uh, and that will work with any language at all up on the um, cache in here. Alright, so let's talk about images. Uh, as I mentioned, images are the primary source of paper. Anything you can do to improve your images is going to have the most drastic effect on the performance of your site. So the first thing is format negotiation. So typically, we will look at an image and go, all right, it's kind of a photo, so probably going to be a JPEG, or it's a small number of uh, colors, it's blocks, maybe we'll look at GIF or GIF uh, and ping or PNG. Uh, there are no new formats. So there's WebP, which is supported by Chrome. And there's JPEG XR, which is supported by the latest IE and Edge. And these are um, closer to JPEG in that they are full color formats, but they are got much better compression, potentially much better compression. The same thing like um, where you test like as a ping, like PNG 24 versus the JPEG, you can see which one's smaller. You can do the similar things here. So what you can do is you can make these transformations on the server side, compare the results, and decide, okay, this smaller is a WebP, so for Chrome, I will serve them a WebP image instead of the original JPEG, right? Um, so to follow along with that is just compression. Um, so who's familiar with the JPEG level, 0 to 100? Who knows what they need? So they, they don't need anything. It's actually what, what, so it's completely down to the compressor as to what they need. So, if you have different tools, 60 is not 60 everywhere. Uh, so we ran into an issue uh, just this week where uh, libgd, which is one of the uh, image libraries that PHP uses and WebPageTest also uses, um, their 60 is different to our 80 that we use on the Act Uh You get the same image quality, the same size, but 60 is not 80, right? Um, so JPEG levels are kind of useless. So you can just say, yeah, we'll just have a generic 60, 80, whatever. We'll just pass everything through that. We're okay with that. We get decent images. They're okay size. But there is a better way. So let's talk about perceived quality. So as I mentioned earlier, 
as a designer, if you want high fidelity in your images, you should be responsible for compressing them. But I'm going to cheat a little bit and say as developers, we actually have a great way to compress in a way that will make our designers happy through this idea of perceived quality. So perceived quality is quality that humans can see. It is not what computers can derive, but what humans can see. Um, so nobody can see that, but it's an amazing image of a lady standing in front of a star cube. Um, and this one here is like a terrible rendering of it. So I had an image that was originally 16.8 megs, uh, and it was a huge image. And to make it look terrible, I had to like resize it down to 50 pixels. Because like I literally did the JPEG slider down to zero, and it still looked good to me. So I'm like, okay, resize it down to 50 pixels, and then resize it back up to 5,000, and just completely wreck it. Um, but using those JPEG numbers, so the original is 16.8 megs, 90 immediately drops it to 5.8, 80, 4.2, etc. We're all the way down to um, uh, zero here, which is 393 kilobytes. And what you can't see, but I can, is that there is very little difference between the two images. Now, if you look very closely, especially on a display like this as opposed to like that, you can see a little JPEG artifact in some of the more detailed parts of the image. Um, and maybe as a designer, you wouldn't be happy with that. But maybe we all. So what can we do to um, actually compress in a way that is uh, doing it in such a way that it is about perceived quality, not about just size? Um, so how can we programmatically determine what number we can get to as far as that compression level before we start to get degradation in that image. So there's a really cool algorithm called SSIM. Uh, it is actually an Emmy Award winning algorithm. <laughs> I don't like how it got up on the stage to accept the statue, but this is the truth. It won an Emmy and it was originally developed for like um, uh, video compression, so individual frames. Um, so what the SSIM, uh, SSIM algorithm does is it uh, is an algorithm that determines three different attributes: brightness, contrast, and structure, which are the three visual uh, parts of an image that we as humans perceive quality to be around. And most importantly, SSIM is fast at doing that. And what we can do is we can use DSSIM, which is a way to measure the distance between two SSIM scores and determine how much degradation is happening in perception. I'm hoping no, you can't see that. Um, so with the SSIM tool, it is possible to render these awesome heat maps. You can actually see, um, uh, like visually, like it's, you know like the, that, the FLIR, the FLIR, um, infrared images where like yellow is hotter, etc. Um, you can actually see that kind of information, where the degradation is happening. Um, that's useful for humans. But what we can get out of it is these scores, so these DSSIM scores. So where we went from um, 16 point something megs down to uh, was it uh, 5 point something megs for that 90% or 90 compression ratio? Um, we get a DSSIM score of 0 0.09. So that's how far differently it is from the original source. Um, and we can follow this down. And what we can do is we can set a perceptive quality threshold. We can say that we are okay with that image becoming s within, a, 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 within a certain distance of the original. So for example, if we decide that our threshold is going to be 0 0.2, or 0.02, sorry, um, then we can compress at all the different levels until we get a compression level that is within that threshold, but no more. So at the original 14.1 megs, I'm sorry, um, and then at 30 is where we get 0 0.017. As soon as we got on to 20, it's 0 0.2, what was it? Uh, 0 0.20, so we're over the threshold. Of 0 .2. So we can, we can make these decisions. And this is actually a discussion you can have with your designer. You can say, look, let me know when you start seeing the degradation that you're unhappy with, and we will set a threshold there. Um, so there, there is an open source tool uh, called SSIM. There's many implementations of it. Some of them suck, some of them set fault, um, but there are, they are out there. Go and check them out. Um, but long and short of it is, is, in this particular example, we save over 90% of the size without losing any perceptively visual uh, clarity. Is it part of it? Say what? Is this part of I do not believe it is part of the uh, But it should be if it's not, because it's kind of awesome. Um, if you didn't, I mean, I, I showed the algorithm, like, surely anyone here can build it, right? Like, I'm like, that. Uh, I'm glad that like, there's a Wikipedia page, like, with an image. That's where that came from, but I don't know what it means. Um, all right, so moving on from the back end, do we have front end people here? Okay, you have a few. 
Um, so as I mentioned, everyone has a role to play. So um, for front-end people, uh, we have what's known as predictive browsing, uh, more commonly called pre-browsing. And pre-browsing is a really cool technique. Um, it's really new. And what it allows you to do is to um, preemptively perform some of the uh, necessary uh, parts of the connection for uh, subsequent um, navigation. So uh, there's four main parts of pre-browsing. There is DNS prefetching, uh, which means, you know, let's go ahead and fetch the DNS entry for a given URL. TCP preconnecting. Let's pre-connect to a server. When I send a request, we're just going to open up a TCP pipe. There's prefetching, which is getting the data. And then finally, there's pre-rendering, which is actually rendering the requested data off screen as if it were visible in the browser. And then you can just flip to it when they navigate to that item. Um, so if you've seen uh, any sites that do like full page transitions and like immediately the next page loads, that's how that's happening. Um, so let's see, I have pretty diagrams until this works. So if you have a Chrome browser or any browser, um, the first one is DNS prefetch. This is the first part of making a request. So when you go out to the DNS servers, you go ahead and uh, resolve the DNS. We then open up a TCP connection. So TCP reconnect to the server. We preload and pull that data down. We just hold it in memory. We don't do anything with it. And then finally, there is that pre-rendering where we render it off screen. So that's kind of the whole view of this. And these things are all really actually simple to implement. So uh, they're all using link tags in your head. So here we have link rel DNS prefix, prefetch, href equals, and then there's no protocol. It's just slash slash and then the domain because there is no protocol. DNS or the DNS account, right? So just Look up example.org and get the DNS entry for it. Uh, I'll find out all kinds of stuff to look at. Um, the next one then is pre rendering. It's not. It's. Oh, it's pre connect. Uh, yeah, pre connect. Um, so here we now specify the protocol because now we're actually either making an HTTPS or an HTTP connection. So we need to know where are we going to open up that TCP connection to, right? So uh, very similar except it's well equals pre connect, right? Which Pretty easy. <laughs> Prefetching, <laughs> rel equals prefetch. This time you can use a relative URL because it's now a page potentially on the same domain or not. Um, and then finally, pre render, which is basically the same with pre render. Now, I want to caution you awesome image. Um, if you use pre render, you remember earlier those pretty bar charts and stuff, all of the things that have to happen to render a page, those still have to happen. And if you're still doing stuff, uh, then you may be running into resource contentions trying to render something else. So that's something to bear in mind. Um, you can do like JavaScript to add the pre-render after your existing page is uh, rendered, for example, to kind of solve some of that. Just be cautious, especially on mobile, because you could potentially be loading a lot of data that you don't. Now, on top of pre-browsing, there is a new standard that is being worked on, which is colloquially, I guess, known as rel equals preload. And it's similar to prefetch. Um, so the difference between prefetch and preload is all the pre-browsing stuff is to do with subsequent navigation. <coughs> so you say you come into the home page for a site, the 90th percent of the people are going to click on excellent next, so we're going to do all pre-browsing for that. The preload, however, is to do with the current navigation. So one other thing with that, subsequent navigation and optional. Um, preload is meant to be a mandatory <coughs> thing, and it's a high priority, and it's for the current application. So you can say, I want to preload my CSS or my fonts, um, and typically it's sent as a head rather than a link tag because of that. So, um, for example, uh, link slash resource, semicolon, rel equals preload. If you request a site, typically the browser has to pull down the HTML, parse through it, find the CSS tag, find the JavaScript tag, etc. Then if the CSS has some resources, fonts, and images, it has to part through the CSS, make subsequent requests. With link preload, what you can do is just say, these are all the things you're going to need. And you can start fetching those during those parsing things before it's actually found those resources. And by the time it needs them, it's already downloaded them in their own cache. Um, and that's really, really cool when you have really fast pipes. So, um, with all of these things, we start to look at new architectures. And essentially, if you take nothing away from this talk, it's that HTTP1 sucks. 
And the reason that it sucks is we have had to come up with a number of tools that are quite frankly ingenious, but also they're hacks. So minifying and concatenating jobs are in CSS to minimize the number of requests that we're making. Uh, we also do inlining with small JavaScript and CSS called critical path. So we will take just the amount of CSS and JavaScript necessary to render what's above the folds, so what's visible on the page, and we'll put that in the HTML. <coughs> so there's no separate lesson. There's a problem with that. There's a downside with that, which is that it's in every page because you don't know if they need it or not. Um, we use image sprites, which are a pain to maintain, and data URIs, which are also a pain. Uh, we also do things like domain sharding. So all browsers have a limit of the number of concurrent connections they can make to the same domain. Most browsers are six, i.e. is eight. But that's not many when we're downloading 150 resources, right? So we'll shard, we'll do s1 dot whatever, s2 dot whatever, just spread the load out across domains, even if it's the same um, servers in the background. So as I mentioned, all of these things are hacks. They're really clever hacks, but they are hacks. So with HTTP2, um, we have something called multiplexing, which is this really cool idea of using one connection for many parallel requests. And along with that, we also get server push, which uh, is very much like link preloading, um, except that you, the server is just saying, here's the data, you don't need to send a header and have it suffer request. Just send it. Um, you can also do things like set dependencies between resources. So you can say, uh, if you are downloading this, I also want you to download this, but not until it's done. So if you're downloading the CSS, I also want you to download the fonts, but get the CSS first. Um, and we can also assign weights, which is a great way to actually say the priority of the different things that you're sending. And then between the browser and the server, you'll negotiate kind of how much resources you, you give to each thing. So with HTTP2, we get this fantastic priority tree, which is still being worked on in terms of browser and how they're implementing it. But we have this idea of like, um, all of these different things that come together to determine how a page is delivered across the wire is that let's just send everything out at once and see what happens. So when we look at delivering a page now, please, uh, yes, um, what we can do now is things like this. So we have a browser and a server, TCP connection. We send an HTTP request and we get a response. We can now also, instead of inlining our critical path, we can do server pushes with separate files, which are individually cacheable, so we know whether they need it. Same way as we do with any request. They can just say, I've already got this. Don't send it to me again. We've got a last modifier. Um, we also send like our logo, because that's really important to render at the top of the page. Right? So we can send them, force those down there. Not really force those down the front. But we can also say, well, I'm sending my critical path CSS, but we also want the fonts, because we have headers that are shown at the top of the page. So let's make that dependency. When you're done downloading the CSS, grab the fonts. Also, grab the rest of the JavaScript, because they're probably going to scroll at some point. We really hope they're going to scroll. And then finally, we follow along with the last CSS, like the majority of our CSS, the final part. So this can get really, really interesting. Now, I want to point out that this is all new. This is an idea. This is not something that is, I'm not saying that this is the best practice. Like, I want to be clear. Everybody is discovering all of this stuff right now. So you have a role to play in this. If you're interested in performance, you should be looking at these kind of things and these different architectures and checking it out. So in summary, performance matters. Time is money. We know that. But time is also user satisfaction. And so we can say that performance is your experience, and all of that is money. So, I'm at Shaft on Twitter. I am dshaft at acmy.com. Uh, it's a terrible way to reach me, though, I'll be honest. Um, these slides will be up at dshaft.com slash slides, and I would love to have questions. Thank you. Okay, so the question was, how do you fight the battle between shipping new features and adjusting for performance? Um, performance is money. Like, it's what it's going to come down to. So while features are also money, like, we know that. That's what our point is our bread and butter. Losing money is the opposite of making money, and bad performance is losing money. So it's it's juggling at of every single thing. It has as much priority as shipping features, and you just make the trade off as you do between different features. Like I don't think it's a separate concern. It's it's in the same things. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs>